Thanks a lot, Sachin, for the introduction, and uh, for cinematic effect. We're gonna do this. Okay, so um, I'm very excited to be here today to tell you some of, about some of our new research on uh, how we can sense the world wirelessly, and how we can redefine machine perception in the age of IoT. So the concept of the Internet of Things was born exactly 20 years ago. It happened in a meeting between. Um, uh, between Procter and Gamble and, MIT, and a supply chain group at MIT. And what they wanted to do is that they wanted to make supply chain much more efficient. And their idea was that they wanted to take battery-less devices, like the one you see in my hand, which they call RFIDs, radio frequency identifiers, and put them on all manufactured items. And with that, they would have an enormous amount of visibility. They'd be able to identify items in warehouses, uh, in distribution centers, and even at points of sale. And in many ways, they have succeeded. Today, more than battery-less devices are attached to more than 100 billion things. Uh, this ranges from everything from uh, clothes and food to uh, pharmaceutical drugs and even to patients in hospitals. In fact, entire countries like Japan declared that in three years, every single item to be manufactured must be tagged with an RFID. And the reason this is amazing is that it bridges the physical world with the digital world. It enables us to identify, sense, and perceive the world, the physical world, at an unprecedented scale. So, so what's it? When you say devices, how do you define a device? Are something that has an RFID? Or? These battery, for these battery-less devices, I mean, even these are just RFIDs, yeah. So, the Given all of this, uh, uh, these battery-less devices, I wonder whether we could use this pervasive IoT infrastructure to sense and perceive the world. For example, can I transform my home into a smart home so that whenever I lose my shirt that has an RFID on it, it can use the RFID signals to find it for me? Or for example, can I enable robots to use RFIDs that are on items to perceive them and go ahead and grasp them or manipulate them? Or maybe I could use the RFID that is on a, uh, on a food packaging in order for me to sense food contamination. Despite the pervasiveness of this infrastructure, unfortunately, the answer to all of these questions is no, none of this is possible today. And the reason why is very fundamental. Because these devices are battery-less, they have very limited range, localization accuracy, and sensing capability. So for example, Today, if you want to be able to read a, a, uh, an RFID, you typically need to be within a range of three to five meters from it. What about how much can I get uh, uh, in terms of localization? Well, if I want to try to locate it, the main thing that I can do is that I can just detect it within radio, radio range. So I could try to use a device like this and go into my uh, uh, room to find my shirt, but I probably already know that my shirt is in my room. And their sensing capability is also very limited. The vast majority of these battery-less devices, the main thing that you can do with them is just identify them. They have a 96-bit identifier. So despite the pervasiveness of this infrastructure, today we're still very far from the vision of being able to sense, communicate with, and locate every object. In this talk, I will be telling you how we can overcome these limitations and how we can transform hundreds of billions of battery-less devices into powerful sensors. How we're gonna use these sensors to deliver tasks like microlocation, robotic perception, deep tissue communication, and non-contact contact food sensing. And not only that, we're gonna do all of this without changing their hardware in any way. 
So let me start by telling you about an example system that we built that allows us, that focuses on part of the vision. And in this system, I'm gonna show you how we can achieve wide area localization by using drone. Remember that one of the biggest problems of RFIDs is that they have a very limited communication range. So for example, even if every single item in a warehouse is tagged with an RFID, it's still very difficult to read all of them. Today, the way it works is that you have an employee who walks around with the, uh, with the portable RFID reader to try to scan everything. And when you take into account that the smallest Walmart warehouse is larger than 40 football field, it makes sense why a single inventory count takes more than two months and makes them lose a lot of, uh, many, uh, a lot of money. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a, a relay for uh, RFID signals and mount it on a drone and use it for wide band, for wide area sensing and localization. So I'm gonna show you a video uh, that we created. So this is the, the uh, relay that we built and we mounted it on the drone in order to use it in warehouses. And I'm gonna show you now, this is from the field of view of the relay and it is able to, we overlay it with the output of our device so it's able to detect an RFID and then after a while it's also able to localize it. And the high level idea is that it takes a wireless signal, it is able to fly near objects, so it transmits a signal and it gets a response from the RFID and as it moves, it is able to get responses over time and combine them to get, uh, to accurately localize uh, RFIDs even if they are inside uh, containers. And our vision here is to be able to have these uh, drones fly up and down aisles and be able to catalog items in warehouses. Now, the reason why I like to start by giving this example is because it shows how we can overcome the constraints of uh, RFIDs by taking into account the asymmetric computational resources as we're designing our system. So over here, without changing the hardware of the RFIDs in any way, we were able to sense and it over a wide area and achieve accurate positioning. And this pattern of uh, scaling to a large number of devices through uh, a design that takes into account the asymmetric computational resources is going to keep repeating through the different systems that I'm gonna be telling you about in this talk. Now, while uh, I will not describe this uh, exact system in details, I'm very proud that we've recently transitioned it to Intel and they're using it in one of their uh, upcoming products. So uh, I'm gonna start in this talk by telling you how we can take a batteryless uh, RFID and try to use it to achieve microlocation. Now, the RFID today is like a sticker. It costs about three cents. And the way it works is that a device called the reader sends a signal that powers it up, and then it responds with this identifier, which enables you to read and identify it from a distance. Now, I don't just want to identify it. What I want to do is to be able to accurately locate it. And to locate the tag, what I want to do is to measure the distance between the reader and the tag. And to do that, I'm gonna use an equation that we all know, which is that the distance is equal to the time of flight, which is the time it takes the signal to travel, multiplied by the speed of light. So if we can measure the time of flight, and we know that the signal travels at the speed of light, then I can get the distance. And the question becomes, how can we measure the time of flight? The simplest way to measure the time of flight is to transmit a pulse and measure the, top, the time it takes the pulse to travel. So let us say that we transmit a pulse at some time t, and we capture it after, uh, uh, after some interval, then the time between when we transmit it and we got the response is called the time of flight. And to capture this received pulse, I want to sample the received signal. And my sampling is going to define my time resolution, the time at which I know that the pulse has come back. Now remember that the distance is equal to the time of flight multiplied by the speed of light. And what that means is that my distance resolution is also going to be equal to the time, of, to the time resolution multiplied by the speed of light. And because time and frequency are inversely related, I can also express this as a speed of light divided by the bandwidth. So what is the bandwidth of these batteryless off-the-shelf RFIDs? Their bandwidth is of the order of 100 kilohertz. What this means is that if I want to use these RFIDs to compute the time of flight, I'm gonna get an accuracy of three kilometers. 
In fact, this is why existing systems cannot measure the time of life on off-the-shelf RFID. And instead, what they do is that they require special ultra-wideband tags. These ultra-wideband tags are much more expensive and also much less ubiquitous than RFID. So how can we bring ultra-wideband ranging to the billions of deployed batteryless RFID? Our solution idea is that we're going to exploit the frequency agnostic nature of the RFID's communication and use it in order to emulate a wide sensing bandwidth. And let me tell you what I mean by this. I'm gonna start by showing you a very simplified RFID schematic with an antenna, a power harvester, and a, and a switch controller, as well as an antenna switch. The way the RFID works is that it communicates bits of zeros and ones by switching, by uh, changing the switch between two states. So for example, when the switch is on, the signal that comes in is going to flow into the power harvester. But when the switch is on, it's almost as if you have a short circuit. So what's gonna happen is the signal that comes in is going to bounce off the ground and be re-radiated. Re and by switching between these two states, the RFID can communicate bits of zeros and ones. Now, uh, here's a very simple analogy. You can uh, think of the RFID, the, what we call the backscatter communication of RFID, as if you have a mirror. When the mirror is pointed away from you, if you try to transmit the signal, you're not gonna get any reflection. But when the, signal, when the mirror is pointed towards you and you transmit a signal, this signal is going to be reflected. And the reason why this, the mirror analogy is very nice is because it allows us to understand why the modulation is frequency agnostic. So if I try to transmit another frequency at the same time, I'm not gonna get any reflection when, it's, when the switch is off, but when the switch is on, if I transmit another frequency at the same time, I'm going to get a reflection. Great. So can I just take any wideband signal, transmit it, and get its reflection, and estimate uh, a wideband signal of the RFID? Well, it's not simple, and it's problematic for two reasons. The first reason is that I need to power up the RFID in the first place. So remember that it needs to switch between these two states, and it can only switch between these two states if it powers up in the first place. And the second reason is that RFIDs are optimized to harvest power within a relatively narrow band. So if I take my power and I stretch it over a wide bandwidth, it will not be, it will not de deliver sufficient energy to power me. So to overcome this problem, we introduced a technique which we call dual frequency excitation. It's a technique that enables us to uh, sense the RFIDs, uh, to enable wide band sensing on narrow band RFIDs. And let me explain to you how it works. Instead of transmitting one signal, what we're gonna do is we're gonna transmit two frequencies at the same time, in a specific way. So we're gonna transmit the standard RFID reader's communication signal, which is inside the ISM band. And at the same time, we're gonna transmit another signal outside the ISM band. Now when the RFID receives the signal that it expects, it's gonna harvest energy from it and power it up. And then, once it powers up, it's going to modulate both of these frequencies at the same time. And for the non-ISM frequency, I can actually transmit a wideband signal, which enables me to estimate the channel of a wideband. But there's still one problem. How can we perform wideband sensing despite FCC regulation? So if I try to plot the power as a function of frequency, FCC allows me within the ISM band to transmit high power which is typically used to power up the RFID. But outside of this band, the FCC masks limits the amount of power that I can transmit to 10,000 times slower. Now the really nice thing about dual frequency excitation is that I can transmit a signal, a high power signal inside the ISM band to power up and communicate with the tag. And at the same time, I can transmit a low power frequency outside, the, outside that band, which is within the FCC mask or lower than the FCC mask, Enable me to estimate, enabling me to estimate the channel. Now, of course, the description that uh, I said is actually simplified in multiple ways. First, the uh, RFID modulation is not entirely frequency agnostic, and you can't send tens of gigahertz off an RFID. 
And the second complexity is that you actually need to structure your wide band signals in a specific way so that they're compatible with the uh, backscatter transmission. So for the communications people over here, if I try to transmit an OFDM symbol and the RFID switches in the, in the middle of my symbol, what it's going to do is that it's going to create a fast fading channel that's going to corrupt my wide band estimate. And what we do is that we incorporate these constraints of backscatter into our design so that we can estimate the channel over a wide band. Okay, you had a question. Yeah, um, the FCC statement with the um, allowed band versus the non-ISM band. Yeah. Are you able to transmit in the non-ISM band without a license? I was under the impression that only research institutions were able to transmit in a wide band outside of pre-10 gigahertz. Yeah, so that's, um, you can actually, as long as you are below a specific uh, mass. So it depends on how much power, it always depends on how much power you're trying to transmit. And the FCC allows you, there are bands which would, in which you can actually transmit as long as you are below some mass. And this is true for non-licensed, non-research institutions? Yes, for the research institutions, you can transmit at higher power if you get an SPM license from the FCC. <coughs> so actually, ultra-wideband tags do transmit between three to 10 gigahertz, and they are, they are used. Okay? And uh, the basic take home message here is that our technique of dual frequency excitation enables us to estimate the wide band channel while being compatible with the RFID communication protocol, the EPC Gen 2 protocol, and at the same time being compliant to the FCC regulations. Yes? Yeah, how sharp is the, the cutoff on both sides of that? It's pretty sharp. Like, it's, uh, the FCC just defines them as very sharp regions with which this is the high power you can transmit in this region, this is the power that you can transmit elsewhere. So on the margin is in that 902 to 928, in those limits? So there's, it's a little bit more complicated, the, the actual uh, mass, but you could transmit below, for example, the lower bound. And it's good, like usually more than 50 gigahertz, so it's probably more than even 10 kilohertz. If I look at the mass that they specify, on this side, it is even more. You are absolutely right. Yeah. On this side, it's it is uh, thirty. It is thirty or forty dB. On the other side, on one, it's there's some asymmetry uh, between them. <laughs> yeah. You don't really know where the whole thing is. Can can you tap on that to power up several because <coughs> you get signals from all of them? Okay. This is a good question. Uh, the nice thing about remember that you're transmitting two at the same time. So the RFID communication protocol allows you to actually select the device that you want to power up. And so that makes sure that you're not having collision. Okay, so we went ahead and we implemented this idea. We implemented it on uh, USRP uh, software radios. Um, and uh, we used two uh, for transmission and one for reception. So because remember, we're transmitting two signals at the same time. And uh, uh, our device is compliant to the, uh, our, our implementation is compliant to the RFID's protocol, which is the EPC Gen 2 protocol and to FCC regulations. And we tested it with all the shelf RFIDs, like this one that I showed you, which we bought. And uh, the basic question is how much bandwidth can we emulate? So over here, on the X axis, I plot the frequency, and on the Y axis, I plot the SNR EDB. And the RFID's communication bandwidth alone is 40 uh, kilohertz. Now, even if we use our technique across the entire ISM band, you only have 226 megahertz. But using our system, we're able to get a much wider uh, bandwidth, which spans even more than 300 megahertz using this two-frequency excitation approach. Now, this, as I said, we estimate this by transmitting this uh, uh, wide band signal that spans this entire uh, frequency. Yeah. Talk about the channel estimation. How are you getting so much SNR? Because those signals are very deep, and then you're already getting a back there. Yes. And then that's much weaker. So yeah. So one of the things is when you transmit at a lower power, you are uh, you also reduce your um, so you know right in in, in uh, like full duplex. One of the biggest uh, sources of noise is that the transmitted signal itself. And with today, today, most of the RFID readers, they're limited by the transmission, by the noise of it, the transmitted signal itself. But is the receiver really sensitive enough? Because the reflection or that <coughs> reflection, you know, you're probably transmitting at what, minus 20 dBm? Yes. Uh, by the time it comes back, you're at, I don't know 
what that dimension would look like, but it's very deep. So well, you can, it, the, but you can then correlate over and get multiple measurements over time, and then you can average them and pick them up off the noise. Okay, so, and the estimated bandwidth, the emulated bandwidth is about 10,000 times larger than the actual communication bandwidth and about 10 times larger than the ISM bandwidth. So given this bandwidth, how can we go to uh, achieve uh, an accurate location. So given a, a wideband channel estimate, one of the approaches is to simply perform an inverse Fourier transform over the wideband channel, and that gives you the time, you can go from the frequency domain to the time domain, and you can find the peak or the first received signal, and that gives you the time of flight. You can multiply the time of flight by the speed of light, and that will get you the distance. Now given the distance, now that you have the distance from the RFID to an antenna, you, can, you know that the RFID is on a circle that is centered at the antenna. Of course, one circle is not enough to localize. You can add a second one and a third one, and by intersecting them, you can get an estimate of the location. Now remember that we don't just get circles because we have a certain uh, distance resolution. What we get is rings, and we try to intersect these rings, and we have some estimate of where the, the RFID is. So next, what I want to show you is the localization accuracy that we get as a function of bandwidth. So over here on the x-axis, I plot the bandwidth, and on the y-axis, I plot the localization accuracy. And this is the uh, error that we get if we try to use the ISM band alone. So as you can see, our median error is between 50 and 100, about 75, and our 90th percentile error is about 3 meters. So that's still relatively poor accuracy. But as you increase the bandwidth, the error gradually goes down, because the error that you're going to get, remember, the resolution is inversely proportional to the bandwidth. And using our system, you're able to get uh, an, uh, a resolution of an accuracy of about 20 to 30 centimeters. Now, if you did the math in your head, you realize that 20 to 30 centimeters is about four times better than what you would have gotten if you only used the bandwidth. And there's two reasons for this. First, the actual estimate is um, the speed divided by two times the bandwidth, because it's round trip, so that gives you two times improvement. And then, instead of just using a simple inverse Fourier transform, what we did over here is that uh, we did an inter we used an interpolated inverse Fourier transform, and that allows us to achieve higher accuracy under certain SNR under certain SNR assumptions. Well, you, you assume that you have direct line of sight. No, no, actually, the really nice thing about this is that you don't have. It works despite not. You, okay, you have a direct line of sight, but it's not the only thing that you have. So you have multipath reflections in the environment. Mm -hmm. But because you have a wide bandwidth, that enables you to isolate the reflections coming from different places, and then you can focus on the reflection that comes, the first one that comes in time. But then why not come directly? Why do you reflect it as well? So there is a, there is a, uh, a, a direct path, but it might not be the dominant path. It, not, it might not be the strongest path. But because you have a wide bandwidth, that's the nice thing about having a wide bandwidth and the resolution, where the resolution comes from. Okay. What are the systems like the intermediate bandwidth? <coughs> what, what kind of system? So this is all us. This is all you? Yeah, this is including this. This is also us. Yeah. So, and what we've shown is that we can achieve decimeter localization by estimating the time of flight on narrow band RFID. So now we can, to some extent, estimate the time of flight on narrow band RFID. So we got excited. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to achieve even higher accuracy. <coughs> so specifically, what we wanted to do is to enable things like uh, robotic perception. Over the past few years, the uh, robotics community has been very interested in building these uh, ro agile robots that can grasp and manipulate different items that can grip them. And they typically rely on cameras or vision-based systems which suffer in cluttered environments. So we thought that if you could use, if you could achieve very high accuracy using RFIDs, then you would enable, you would extend these systems to be able to work in cluttered environments. The biggest problem is that to enable grasping and manipulation, actually the gripper, in order for it to work, <coughs> typically needs sub-centimeter precision. It needs very high accuracy. And so in the next part of the talk, what I'm gonna be telling you about is how we build the first RFID-based system that enables accurate positioning for fine-grained robotic tasks. Our system has sub-centimeter localization accuracy in the X, Y, and Z dimensions. It has very low latency of 7.5 milliseconds, and it has a frame rate of 300 hertz. 
And we actually went ahead and we built a real-time implementation with robotic arms and nanotrons. So going back to what we need to do is we need to achieve uh, sub-centimeter uh, positioning accuracy. Now the first question that you might ask me is, why don't I simply transmit a, uh, a much wider bandwidth signal and try to estimate its reflection? Why don't I use the dual frequency excitation approach, but with an even wider band signal? So let's go back to the equation, which is that the distance resolution is equal to the speed of light over the bandwidth. And if I want one centimeter resolution by estimating the time of flight, that would require a bandwidth of about 30 gigahertz. So trying to build a system with a bandwidth of 30 gigahertz is going to be much more expensive. You're gonna have an IO problem of trying to process 30 giga samples per second. And not only this, even if you can do that, the RFIDs are just not going to backscatter 30 gigahertz. They do have, it's frequency agnostic within some limits. So what some of the existence systems try to do is that they try to use the phase to achieve higher accuracy. And let me tell you what I mean by this. Let's say that you have a transmitter and, there, and uh, you have a receiver and you transmit a signal. Now the wireless signal travels as a wave and it arrives at the receiver with some phase speed. And if I can measure this phase, then I can map it directly to the distance because the phase is equal to two pi multiplied by the distance divided by the wavelength. So if I measure the phase, I can recover the distance accurately. The problem, however, is that the phase actually wraps around every two pi. And what this means is that instead of having just one candidate, I have multiple possible distance, lo distance locations. And this large number of candidates is typically called the phase cycle ambiguity. So what this means in terms of localization is that instead of having uh, knowing that the RFID lies on a circle, it could be on any number of concentric circles that could be smaller, uh, that could have a radius smaller or larger than the one where it actually lies. But remember that we already can use the bandwidth, and we know that using the bandwidth, we, it should be one of the circles that lie within this range. So by combining both the phase and the bandwidth, we are able to significantly reduce the ambiguity. So let's say that now we go ahead and we try to add another antenna. And with this, you are left with a certain number of candidates. So how do I know which of these is true? Well, a simple approach is to go ahead and try to add even a third antenna. And actually, in the noiseless case, all of these antennas are going to intersect at one location, and that location is going to be the true location uh, where the RFID is. Of course, in practice, you do have noise. And when you do have noise, your estimates are going to be off. So the circles might not intersect at all, all of them, or they might intersect at the wrong location. So is there no way for us to try to combine the bandwidth and the phase to get accurate locations? So to overcome, to be able to fuse these measurements together, what we came up with is a super resolution algorithm that fuses spatial measurements using a Bayesian framework. And let me explain to you how we model our Bayesian framework. So let us go back to the uh, concentric circles with one antenna, and let us go back also to 1D. So I'm gonna take a slice, and what I want to do is I want to try to model the distance distribution. So I want to try to plot the probability as a function of distance, and remember that each of these is one of the possible location estimates. Now one option is that I could try to model this as a discrete distribution, which assigns zero probability outside these estimates. But if I do that and there is actually noise, then I'll go back to the problem where the circles might not intersect at all. Another approach is to try to model it as a wide Gaussian, and a wide Gaussian will enable me to deal with noise. But the problem is if I model it with wide Gaussian, I lose the fact that these discrete candidates actually do have a higher probability, and this is something that I already know. So in order for us to take all of this, inf all of this uh, uh, information into account, what we do is that we model it as a mixture of narrow Gaussians. These Gaussians are centered at each of the possible phase estimates. Their width and their width is given by my phase noise or my signal to noise ratio. And the nice thing about this model is that it captures both the phase and bandwidth information and it generalizes to practical scenarios with noise. 
So let me go ahead and show you how what happens if we try to incorporate this model into our localization system. So over here on the left, I'm showing you a sample uh, 2D setup where I have one reader and I have a tie. And to the right, I'm going to show you one of the uh, output, an output from one of the antennas. So this output shows 2D space, and I'm showing it as a heat map where navy blue indicates low probability, and uh, yellow or orange indicates high prob probability. And the interesting thing here, you see a bunch of concentric circles which correspond to the different possible uh, location estimates. Remember that we're modeling them as mixture of galaxies. Now let me show you what happens when we add a second antenna and a third antenna. As you can see now, we are, we are able to get the uh, highest likelihood position, and it does map to the true position. Now there are other candidates still over there, but they have lower probability. So this is one of the good examples that we had, and let me show you another experiment in a slightly different environment, and let me show you what we, what we got that. So this is the output of another experiment, and over here, this is the actual position of the RFID, but this is the one that has the highest likelihood. So both of them are possible candidates, but the candidate that has the highest likelihood turned out to be a different one. So to overcome this problem, what we, what we do is that we leverage the fact that there is motion. And what we're going to do is rather than just, spa just using spatial measurements, we're going to fuse measurements across time and across space. So we're going to fuse spatial temporal measurements. And the basic idea is that we're going to leverage target motion and probabilistically combine measurements over time. Now the really interesting thing about what we do is that we're able to do this combination even without knowing what the target motion is, what the target's trajectory is. So for those of you who have a, a radar background, it's almost as if we're trying to do synthetic aperture radar without knowing anything about the trajectory. And the way we do this is by probabilistically modeling what the next location is going to be based on my current location estimate. So let me show you an example of how we're fusing these measurements over time. So remember that this is the output that I originally got, this is the true position, and this is the highest likelihood. And the tag is actually is just moving in space. Now this is the measurement that I get at the second point in time. It's still wrong, third point in time. At the fourth point in time, it jumped, but it jumped, my highest likelihood jumped to another candidate other than the correct one. And over time, <laughs> after seven time steps, it actually does converge to the right candidate. And as you continue in time, you just keep getting more and more measurements that give you, uh, uh, that make you realize that you are at the, at the highest likelihood candidate. And once done, one thing that we do is that we keep track of the trajectories by, of each of the candidates and we're able to backtrace. So if we go ahead and try to backtrace to recover the true trajectory, this is the estimated trajectory that we get and this is the actual true trajectory. So they overlap because we were able to backtrace the trajectory of the correct candidate. Now in my description, I assume two things. I assume that this works in 2D, and I also assume that you have target motion. In practice, we can easily extend this to 3D, and we can extend it to 3D by taking into account that the RFID may be on a sphere, not just on a circle. And the very interesting thing is that this technique works even if the target does not move. And the reason it works is that what we do is that the robot moves around the target. When it moves, it changes the noise in the environment. And when it does so, you are able to exploit that and still, uh, uh, and still uh, combine the measurements over time to be able to achieve an accurate location. Maybe I missed the question. Are you assuming that you know the displacement of the no. tag? No, you don't know the displacement of the tag. So let me formally, uh, uh, let me formally try to, to explain it. So formally, our observation model is a mixture of Gaussians. So you have each of the Gaussians has a certain weight. We can get the weight, for example, from a fractional inverse Fourier transform. And the sum of the weights is one. And we spatially fuse uh, the measurements from the different antennas by, uh, by uh, combining them through a product of, the, of their distribution. And then we also assume that there is a, uh, a transition model. We assume that every point Every point in time is related to the previous point in time using some uh, linear addition. So we assume that the target is going to move and we're gonna draw this motion from a normal distribution. 
So our transition model is linear, but our observation model actually turns out to be nonlinear. And the problem with this nonlinear observation model is that it makes generating the probability heat maps a computationally expensive process. And remember, the reason it's nonlinear is that we're trying to go from a range estimate from a D to an XY, which has a, a quadratic relationship. So we solve this by using an approximate inference <laughs> algorithm. We adopt the successive uh, information sampling to this problem domain. And we are able to actually do, we show that a, an a, we, you could actually do approximate it as a 2D mixture of Gaussians through some geometric approximation. And the computational complexity of the algorithm ends up being big O of n, where n is the number of candidates. Now in the interest of time, I'm not gonna be able to go into details of how we do this modeling, but I'm happy to take questions about it at the end of the talk. So you, you would estimate d lambda sigma squared n the big sigma? We estimate, the only thing that we actually end up caring about estimating is x. No, no, I mean the parameters. Uh, yes. D lambda sigma <laughs> the large sigma. La lambda, you know it. Or it's just uh, sampling the, the displacement between the exponential. Yes. But so you know lambda because lambda is your wavelength. And D is, you have a certain distance estimate which you could map to a number of possible distances. And sigma is constant with respect to i, I think sigma should vary. So you could do two things. Uh, one of the things that you could do is you could try to train a model to try to recover what sigma is. What we realize is in a lot of our applications, sorry, by sigma squared, you mean the, the, the variance, right? Okay, so uh, the, the variance in the first equation I understood that should depend on i. So actually the, the variance in the first equation is de depends on your signal to noise ratio. Because remember that the width of my uh, Gaussians depends on my SNR. So you could use your SNR to estimate. And do you assume that the large sigma is known? You assume, you, we actually, for us, we, because we are sampling at a, at a very high frame rate of 300 frames per second, you could, it turns out that whatever this large sigma is does not really matter. Yeah. So we went ahead and we implemented this. And again, we used our previous implementation of, two free, of dual frequency excitation. And we also used, uh, we combined it with uh, X310 sampler radios that have UBX on board. So we used one for transmission and four for receiving. So now you're oversampling 3D space with four antennas. And we implemented this on a multi-threaded real-time uh, processing architecture. And we got the ground truth using an OptiTrack uh, motion capture system. Uh, this system achieves some millimeter accuracy, but of course it works only in, uh, in line of sight and it, it, you're instrumenting with an infrared module. So let me show you the 3D localization accuracy that we get. Over here on the x-axis, I plot the localization error in log scale on the y-axis, the fraction of measurement. And uh, these are the CDFs that we get. As you can see for x, y, and d, we have a median error less than eight millimeter. And in fact, even the 90th percentile error is less than two centimeters. And what this means is that we are able to achieve sub-centimeter accuracy in each of the x, y, and z dimensions. We're able to do it with very low latency and at a very high frame rate. So let me show you a video of uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the demos that we, we actually did. Um, so I'm gonna show you a, an example where we're trying to do robot object manipulation. These are, over here you can see the two robotic arms. This object is tagged with an RFID that is on it. And what is gonna happen is that this robotic arm is going to try to pick up this object, move it somewhere, the second one is gonna pick it up, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna track these uh, across time. So to the right, now you're gonna see the output, which includes both the actual location and our estimate. So the actual location is in green and our estimate is in red. And you'll see that as you move this object, you're able to track it very accurately. And over here, the antennas that we had were actually occluded from the object. They were not occluded using walls, but using some dividers. While, uh, and this is a relatively cluttered environment for that vision systems would, would find it very difficult to work. So of course our work is, uh, this uh, project is related to uh, prior work in multiple areas. Uh, RF localization is a very well studied problem. Most fast work uh, relies on Wi-Fi, so I'm not gonna talk about it because you can't put Wi-Fi in every single object. But the most related work is in RFID localization systems. 
And task systems make uh, assumptions that are very restrictive for the types of tasks that we want to deliver. So for example, some of these systems need to furnish the entire environment with a large number of survey tags, and they can locate a missing tag by matching it to one of the other ones in the environment. Or they know exactly how the tag is moving in space, and they just want to know where on the trajectory it is. There's another type of systems that cannot localize, but can, they can try to recover the, the shape of the trajectory by tracking the phase. Remember that the phase uh, uh, is not gives multiple candidates, so I could try to track one of the candidates, even if it is wrong, and recover the shape. Of course, none of these will work for the types of tasks that we want to do, because we want the robot to be able to pick up an item from anywhere and manipulate it and probably collaborate on it. Of course, the other set of uh, work that is related is, is in the robotics community. There's been a lot of interest in robot object manipulation for grasping and, uh, uh, and uh, packaging and so on and so forth. And most of these systems rely on vision. The problem with vision is that it suffers in cluttered environments, it fails in non-line of sight, and it requires six sensors. Now, of course, uh, there is no reason why these two types of systems need to be uh, uh, using RF versus using vision need to compete with each other. One of the very interesting questions that I'm now asking is how do you combine both vision and RF together to deliver tasks that neither of them could do on its own? Uh, do you guys use the RFID localization for the gripping or is the gripping now fixed in the demo? So currently the gripping is fixed. We're just tracking this. Now what we're doing is we're trying to build end-to-end -end models that use it in order to train uh, reinforcement learning to do using RF, uh, RFID. Okay, so, so far I've told you how we can take these uh, uh, batteryless uh, RFIDs and how we could use them to achieve things like micro-location and robotics, etc. Another area that we've been uh, very interested in, which is, and which is also very different, is inside the human body. And uh, inside the body, it's actually very important to be batteryless because it's very difficult to replace a battery. And in fact, over the past uh, a few years, we've started seeing companies that implant RFID microchips under the, the people's skin. In fact, even last week, uh, at the World Mobile Congress, there was a man who got, who received a, an RFID implant right under his skin. Now remember that uh, RFIDs have a very limited range, so in space they are limited to about uh, three meters, inside the human body they're limited to a few millimeters. And uh, the only thing that you could do with them is identification. So this is a blog written by another person in popular science who says, my implant is both less scary and less useful than you might think. And this makes sense because if you're just trying to implant it under the skin and use it for identification, frankly, just use an ID. But if you can take these implants and put them deep inside the human body, then you can actually open up a large number of very interesting applications. So what we wanted to do is to take this batteryless tiny, tiny RFID. It has no battery, and what we wanted to do is to put it deep inside the human body and be able to communicate with it and power it from a distance outside the body. And the way it works is that it's gonna harvest signals coming from outside the body, power up, and then backscatter. And this can enable a large number of applications. For example, it can be used in continuous and long-term drug delivery. So today, when you take a pill, you envision that it immediately releases the drug into the body. But for certain types of diseases like malaria, you want to have controlled diseases, controlled release over long periods of time. For, on the other hand, patients with Alzheimer's might forget to take their medications altogether, and you want to be able to sense and trigger a drug release if they forgot to take their medications. Another set of applications is for in-body sensing and diagnosis. Imagine a network of these inside the human body that are sensing our body on the inside. For example, they're trying to sense the gut microbiome to be able to predict a disease, even before its symptoms appear, to enable doctors to have early intervention. So there's a lot of applications if you actually enable deep tissue uh, uh, communication and network with these batteryless devices. So um, last year we showed the first demonstration of a system that can power and communicate with a deep tissue batteryless RFID in a large mammal. And the unique thing about our system is that it is able to do this from meter scale distances outside the body. Now, the key challenge we have to overcome is that wireless signals 
die exponentially fast inside the human body. So if you try to take a wireless uh, device and send the signal, the signals are going to die about 10, a thousand times faster inside the body than in air. And this is why, today, so instead of three meters, you're gonna have few many meters, and this is why today people have to just implant them under the skin. And so it's still not possible to power up these battery based sensors in deep tissue. Now you might be wondering, why don't I simply transmit uh, a, a higher power? Well, actually, I'm not wondering at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you made my life easier. So, uh, there's FCC regulations that people don't want <laughs> to be irradiated with higher power. And not only that, actually, if you transmit at, at higher power, you might go in all uh, directions, and all, very little is received by the RFID, so it is inefficient. Now, the standard solution to overcome this problem is to try to use multiple antennas or mine. So you could use multiple antennas, and you structure their signals in a way so that they constructively interfere at the, your receiver. And in fact, the constructive interference enables miners to achieve 10 times the power gain, over 10 times the power gain. The problem is that MIMO requires you to estimate the channel. So how can you estimate the channel if you were unable to power up the device in the first place and have it respond to you in order to use that signal to estimate the channel? So we were faced with the question of how do you power and communicate with these sensors inside deep tissues despite unknown channels? And our uh, solution idea was to a new beam forming approach that can work under blind wireless channels. This is inspired by past work in, uh, in the area of uh, opportunistic beamforming, but it extends it to batteryless devices. And the basic idea, while I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, the basic idea is that our beamformer introduces frequency shifts rather than phase shifts across the different antennas. And that allows it to beamform under blind conditions. So, for example, instead of taking one antenna, you're going to take multiple different antennas, and instead of transmitting the same frequency from all of them, you're going to transmit different frequencies. And by doing so, this naturally leads to some form of time domain beamforming, where you're able to uh, uh, get a peak that is able to overcome uh, 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 this. So one thing that you might be wondering is, what did I gain? The only thing that I did is I just concentrated all of the energy over, a, uh, uh, over specific points in time. But in fact, this is exactly what I want to do. Because these batteryless, uh, batteryless uh, tags have a minimum threshold voltage that you need to overcome in order for you to power it up, in order for you to power it up. And so in doing so, I achieve, I overcome this threshold voltage at specific points in time. I power it up. Once it powers up, I can now estimate this channel and go back to standard beam forming if I want to. Why don't you use the array to, be, to, to form that beam in space? Like you can focus on a certain... This is an excellent question. And the reason is, you, it, typically when you form a beam in space, you, there's a specific direction in which it is formed. Right? So for example, I know there's 30 degrees or 45 degrees. This is standard antenna array beam forming. The problem is inside the human body, because you have multiple different tissues, the signal is going to reflect, refract, and it's going to undergo different angles. So you can't, there's no specific direction that you would know in which you can beam in. So actually, what I'm going to show, I think I have a result for showing up how, if you try to beam just uh, to directly, that you're still not able to get any, any gain. So I'm not going to go into the details of the math, but I'm happy to answer questions about it at the end of the talk. But I want to quickly show you about uh, some of our evaluation. So the first question is, can we achieve, can we deliver this multi-antenna power gain? So we ran an experiment with a 10, uh, with a 10 antenna beamformer in different tissues. And this is what you get. So you don't get actually any power gain if you try to just combine these antennas in, uh, vertical, uh, for a, a device that is in front of you. And the reason is that it's just going to change its direction and you're unable to estimate this channel. But using our system use it with a 10 antenna beamformer, you're able to achieve about 7.5 to 8 times uh, improvement across different tissues. So over here, we tried with water, with gastric fluid, intestinal fluid, steak, bacon, and chicken. And we showed that you're able to get a large power gain across all of them. And what this shows is that our system is able to deliver MIMO gain 
despite blind channel condition for deep tissue barrier sensor. So let me show you another experiment where we're trying to communicate inside water. So what we're gonna do over here, this is the, uh, you could see a tank with our battery list sensor. So this is me zooming in on it. And these are our beamformer antennas. And what we do is we try to see if we can power it up and get its response. So on the X axis, I'm gonna plot the number of antennas that we use and on the Y axis, the depth at which we're working. Now, over here, I'm showing you our results. You can see that if there's only one antenna, it's almost equivalent to being right under the skin. You can barely get a few millimeters. But using eight antennas, because you're able to do blind beamforming, we're able to achieve more than 20 centimeters of depth inside water. And since the human body is mostly made of water, it's actually one of the most challenging environments to work. Now, these gains also translate uh, to achieving a larger distance in the real world. Remember that I started the talk by telling you that today you can only achieve three to five meters. And what we show is that if this is the received antenna here, our device is on this package our RFID is on this package at the end of the hall, and we show that in air, you're able to power up and communicate from distances up to 38 meters. So this has also a lot of applications, not inside the human body, though the human body is a very interesting one. So, so in the context of a human by human body, yeah. what's the ballpark uh, frequency and power? That so uh, the frequencies are in the UHF band. They're still at 900 megahertz, which you need them to be in order for you to power up because these devices work uh, at that. The amount of power is the 32 dB, which is typically around the, uh, around the FCC level. And is there an understanding that this is not detrimental to one's health? Yeah, so actually what people typically do is they, they try to measure if there's a temperature increase over time to try to see, and we didn't see any temperature increase, but usually also FCC regulations are way below what is detrimental for humans. Like I would have to go back to know the exact ones for the, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Irrespective, you will get the n times gain. Otherwise, you would have gotten the n squ an n squared gain. No, I'll leave you an answer. There's 60 limited 30 dBm over a power angle of a transfer so. I see, I see, I see. That's, that's an interesting question then, in which case you could try to, you could, there's recent work that, that built on ours, and what they showed is that you have a, uh, they tried to synchronize a number of uh, devices that are, that are in the environment, and then they're able to sort of artificially, once they synchronize them, they're able to get 30 dB from each of them. So they use things like distributed uh, MIMO, uh, like, um, and then, that's how they synchronize them and they're able to achieve even, they achieve even better range uh, than we did by building on our work. And uh, in collaboration with some of our, uh, uh, with the doctors at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and um, sorry, Harvard Medical School, we actually did an evaluation inside uh, a living animal. We tested it uh, in a pig and we tested it in two placements inside the pig. We, we, put, it, we put it both uh, under the skin through a three centimeter incision and inside the big stomach. And this was the first time that uh, anyone could demonstrate uh, or, or try in deep tissues from a, a distance outside a, a large mammal. So we ran, this one, I'm gonna tell you about one of the experiments, where we ran an, an uh, uh, we sent the command to the sensor inside the stomach and we tried to get uh, its response. And over here on the X axis I plot time and on the Y axis I plot amplitude. And uh, this is the result that you get. The response is over here. So we were able to get this response. When it is above zero, this corresponds to bits of one, and when it is below zero, it corresponds to bits uh, of zero. And what this shows is that now we can wirelessly power and communicate with barrierless microimplants in deep tissues inside real living and large animals. And now we're working with them on building on this to be able to do things like continuous in-body sensing or, uh, or drug delivery for enabling the different kinds of tasks that I was telling you about. Uh, earlier in the talk. Now, of course, this is uh, related to uh, prior research in two main areas. Uh, one of them is how do you beamform under blind channel conditions? There's been uh, a lot of work that we built on over there. For, and for example, there's been work on opportunistic beamforming, uh, but most of this does require receiver cooperation. It requires to have 
some feedback from the receiver. There's also been work on algebraic or some type or blind source separation, but this happens at the receiver itself. Now the key difference between us and these is that these require receiver cooperation. Our receiver is a batteryless device. You need to power it up in the first place before it can cooperate. So our system extends the ability to work under blind channel conditions to batteryless devices. Another area of research that is related to us is wireless power transfer to micro implants. And there's been a lot of work in this space, including ultrasound, near field, and mid field. The main difference between this and what we're doing is that these systems cannot work from uh, uh, meter scale distances outside the body, which are the types of applications that we were looking into. So we're able to extend these to operate from a distance outside the body and control things that are inside the body. So, so far I've told you about how we could use these uh, dumb battery sensors to enable a number of tasks in microlocation, robotic perception, and deep tissue communication. Let me ask you something, the signals course, that you yeah. just showed, yeah. how can you be sure that there's no reflection from the skin of the eye? Yes, yes, no, that, that's a good question. So we actually correlate with the, we know what the signal that we're expecting is going to be, and if the correlation is higher than a threshold, then, then it is, you're getting it, and if it's lower than a threshold, then you're So recently, we've been interested in a different kind uh, uh, of application, which is uh, how we could use these sensors for uh, non-contact food sensing. And the reason we're interested in this is that food safety has been making headlines around the world nearly every year for the past two decades. So for example, back in 2008, more than 50,000 babies were hospitalized in China because they drank adulterated baby formula. So baby formula was adulterated by mixing it with uh, melanin so that they could artificially increase the amount of protein in it. And that led to a huge nationwide crisis where babies had kidney stones. Another uh, a problem that is ongoing is uh, fake alcohol. Uh, in many developing world countries, fake alcohol is a problem that leads to uh, hundreds of cases of blindness or death every year. So what happens is that you take an alcohol and they add to it methanol, which is much cheaper. And that leads to, uh, to these uh, safety hazards. A third application is uh, one that many of us are, are familiar with, which is the Flint water crisis that happened a few years ago. So in 2014, the residents of Flint, Michigan were exposed to contaminated water. And the government took action only two years later after they discovered that the toxic lead level in children's blood had doubled. And you could have avoided all of these if consumers had a way to immediately de uh, detect contamination. Unfortunately today, the vast majority of food testing has to be performed in specialized food labs. So we went ahead and tested the idea of trying to use RFIDs that are already on uh, food items to be able to sense contamination. And the idea was that, and the reason why we think this is possible, we thought this was possible, <laughs> is because the RFID is going to interact with material that is inside the bottle because the RFID's antenna interacts with things in the near field, even if it is not directly in contact with them. And this interaction is impacted by a material property cause, uh, called uh, the, uh, the um, electric permittivity epsilon. Now, at a very high level, the way it works is that part of the RFID can be modeled as, uh, uh, the antenna can be modeled as a capacitor, and the capacitance is directly related to the uh, electric permittivity epsilon, which means that if the material changes, the permittivity is going to change, and this will impact the RFID's uh, signal that it's, that it's sending back, and we could possibly use this in order for us to sense uh, food contamination. And over here, this is uh, from a recent demo that we did. So we use our dual frequency excitation prototype, which you can see here. So we have one, two transmitters and one receiver. And the goal over here was to try to measure the electric permittivity over a wide bandwidth. So we're somehow trying to do non-contact uh, spectroscopy. And this is the food item. And our preliminary results in this space uh, are, uh, are actually quite promising. We showed that we could uh, detect uh, with over 90% ac accuracy fake alcohol and uh, fake baby formula. Now, of course, one thing that I do want to stress is that these results are still very uh, preliminary, and there's a lot of questions that we're still trying to solve. How do you generalize them to new environments? What is the level of sensitivity that you get? Uh, how do you deal with different bottle shapes, and so on and so forth? But the reason why this specific problem is very exciting for me is because if, you, if it does work in the long run, 
And if, if it works robustly, then it can have huge societal impact. So with this, uh, in this talk, I've told you about our research on how we could try to uh, take barrierless devices and transform them into powerful sensors. And I've showed you how we can enable a number of, uh, of possible different sensing tasks. And this is uh, part of the research that we do, actually. Originally, I started by working on using wireless signals for sensing humans, how you could use wireless signals in the environment to get people locations, gestures, breathing, heartbeats, and even emotions by, without touching their bodies in any way. And this work has had already a huge amount of real-world impact. It is being used in medical studies at major US hospitals. It is being used by doctors to monitor disease progression in patients with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and multiple sclerosis. It's already deployed in hundreds of homes, and it is being used also by pharmaceutical companies to understand the impact of drugs on uh, recovery. And our work in, in barriers perception, some of it has already been transitioned, as I said in the beginning of, of the talk to Intel, we're currently working with doctors and biomedical researchers to take this to the next level and to be able to build these networks inside the body that are used for sensing and, uh, and for treatment or diagnosis. And a third area of research that I didn't touch on at all and which I've become very excited about recently is uh, sub IoT. So last year we worked on, uh, we came up with a new communication mechanism that enables direct communication from underwater to the air. This has been uh, an open problem for over half a century and we showed the feasibility of a new uh, technology that enables direct communication from underwater to the air. Now, of course this is also still in the early stages but I hope and we're now uh, investing in studying how you could make it more practical and testing it at larger depths. And we're also interested in batteryless underwater networking, how you can take this concept of RFIDs and put it underwater to enable us to uh, sense uh, in the ocean and be able to track things like the impact of climate change on underwater environments. And the thing that brings all of these together is that I'm interested in building these systems that enable us to sense the world wirelessly from humans to objects to items to oceans so that we can try to perceive the world at a scale that was not possible before. And with this, uh, uh, I'm happy to wrap up my talk and take any questions. Thank you. So the problem with the underwater and body is that radio signals just die exponentially fast. So you don't want to put an RFID, you don't want to use radio signals underwater. People, what they do underwater is they use acoustic signals or ultrasound. And this is one of the things, but this, the architecture of that scatter can be taken into this uh, new domain to enable you to, to try to work on it. Uh, inside the human body, it depends on what your application domain is. If you're fine with putting something directly on the human body, then you also want to use something that is acoustic. Uh, or, or ultrasonic. But if you want to be able to operate from a distance, then you want to design something like an RFID, and you want to try to, you start running into new kinds of challenges in the antenna design itself, so that you can match it to the uh, to a lossy uh, embodied environment. Yes. Thank you.